Now, we have to ask ourselves a question. When is judicial review available? Now, it has to be clear, therefore, that uh, judicial review is not always available. It must, be, it must be established that the court has jurisdiction to deal with the application for judicial review. And uh, as we will see shortly, uh, jurisdiction can be based on a common law jurisdiction, meaning a claim by the courts uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in ancient times, as far back as 15th century England, that they had the power to uh, examine the lawfulness of the exercise of the powers of the crown. And uh, that common law jurisdiction continues to be exercised today. We will also see that there is a statutory jurisdiction uh, of judicial review, and that can be under either, either, for example, under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 or the Judiciary Act 1903, specifically sections 39, sections 44. But we're going to get into that in a short while. The second element that has to be established is that the dispute must be justiciable, meaning it is something that is appropriate for the court to look into. Because as we said, because of the notion of separation of power, sometimes courts will not uh, examine or review a decision out of deference to the executive. And also in relation to whether or not uh, the dispute actually involves a matter, meaning is there actually an actual controversy that involves rights uh, that may have been violated. Third, we need to look at the what needs to be established is the standing of the applicant. And this is related to uh, that, that issue of matter, meaning does the applicant have certain rights that have been affected or violated, or is there a liability that is imposed on him or her? So there has to be standing. Fourth, there must be a ground for review. And the ground for review typically is on the basis of legal error or unlawfulness. And finally, the remedy um, sought must also be made out. And this is important because the remedy actually determines whether or not the court will actually have jurisdiction. Again, it is important to remember that judicial review as a process is very limited. And as I already said, the, uh, in the process of judicial review, courts are not in a position or don't have the power to actually substitute its own decision for that of the original decision maker. So therefore, in terms of the remedy that will be sought by an applicant, for example, it is limited to a prayer that the decision of the original decision maker be set aside. If it includes, therefore, a prayer that damages, for example, be awarded or that a specific decision be made in behalf of the applicant or that the the decision maker be directed to do this specific act. That, that will be beyond the power of the judiciary to grant in the case of these five are what we might call jurisdictional elements that must be established before judicial review is, is made available. So one, you need to establish jurisdiction. Two, justiciability of the dispute. Third, the standing of the applicant. The fourth, a ground for review. And fifth, the remedy sought must be made out. The other aspect that we have to uh, look at when it comes to, to judicial review would be its two distinct aspects. Some would say that it has two aspects. One is the procedural aspect. The other one is the substantive aspect. And the procedural aspect actually refers to the remedies that courts may grant. And those remedies uh, will typically include certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and injunction. The substantive aspect of uh, judicial review relates to the cr criteria that courts use to determine whether a government action or decision is lawful or unlawful. And such criteria will typically include issues of procedural fairness or natural justice, as I discussed earlier or issues of errors of law, or whether or not uh, the purpose was unauthorized, or whether or not irrelevant considerations were taken into account, or whether or not there was an inflexible application of policy. So these are uh, grounds or criteria for uh, lawful decision making. So that's the substantive aspect. Compared to the procedural aspect, 
which focuses on the remedies that an applicant may seek. Now, earlier I mentioned the possible basis for Commonwealth Judicial Review, and there are actually four of them. Well, actually, there are three of them. So uh, one is common law juris uh, jurisdiction, and that is, uh, as, I, as I earlier pointed out, this is historical in the sense that superior courts of England asserted their rights to be able to examine the lawfulness of decisions made by the crown. Not by the king himself or the queen herself, but uh, other officers of the crown. And so when there were excesses, the superior courts of England uh, would then attempt to uh, assert their prerogative writs of certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, and even habeas corpus. And because... Uh, Australian courts, including uh, the state supreme courts, are actually ha have, actually have uh, that historical link with uh, courts of the UK. There's also an attempt on their part to exercise common law uh, judicial review. This, the second, and the, it's important when we talk about common law uh, judicial review because what it essentially means is that almost any decision made by the executive can be subject to Commonwealth Judicial Review. And we will see a distinction uh, concerning you know, such, such the statutory basis. So except in those instances where because of separation of powers and, the, and a deference on the part of the courts to the executive, uh, in those instances when it is the executive which is in the best position to make decisions, a common law judicial review will mean that, in general, administrative decisions are open for uh, open to judicial review by co by courts exercising their common law jurisdiction. Now, the other uh, statutory base, the other basis for uh, common law judicial review is actually statutory, and there are two uh, particular legislations. One of them is the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 where uh, by that specific legislation, uh, Parliament has said that administrative decisions or decisions of the uh, executive are susceptible to review by courts. Now, what is important there is that it is only decisions made under an enactment that are subject to judicial review. So in other words, other decisions so that are not made under enactment. So uh, this, meaning if it, it might be a decision that involves a contract, for example, or it might be a decision in the ordinary course of, of the activities or functions of uh, an executive, those decisions will not fall within the the purview of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. So as for, for a court to be able to uh, assert its jurisdiction over an administrative decisions under the ADJRA of 1977, the decision must have been made under an enactment. The other statutory basis would be, would be the Judiciary Act of 1903. And... Uh, if you look at sections 39 and sections 44, these are almost similar to the provisions of the Constitution, specifically section 75.3 and section 75.5 of uh, the Constitution, where uh, the court, the High Court in particular, has the power to uh, grant the writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction uh, in relation to an officer of the Commonwealth. And uh, Section 75.3 also, also is, is also the basis, the constitutional basis for the High Court to have all original jurisdiction, jurisdiction over matters where the Commonwealth is a party, in the sense that it's either the one suing or it is the one being sued. Now, Section 75.3 and Section 75.5 have actually been copied uh, into the Judiciary Act of 1903 so that the Federal Court of Australia 
has a, a statutory basis to be able to grant the writs of mandamus prohibition or injunction uh, in relation to officers of the Commonwealth or in, or in instances when the Commonwealth may be a party to a proceeding. Okay, so we have, uh, we earlier, I talked briefly about justiciability. And so justiciability uh, seeks to answer whether or not a particular matter, a, a particular case is actually uh, fit for judicial determination or evaluation. Now, as we said, we must remember that under the uh, principle of uh, separation of powers, the three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the, and part, and the judiciary, are meant to be co-equal. And there is, there is meant to be respect for the powers of, of, of one another. So that uh, the power of the executive is to execute the laws, the power of parliament is to make or create the laws, and the purpose, the function of the judiciary, is actually to interpret the laws. So it must be, it is important that none of the three branches of government should attempt to usurp the powers of the other. And Madison would argue that the moment a single institution would end up having the power to create the law having and has the power to execute the law and also the power to interpret the law, what, then, what you then have is a tyranny. So having this in mind, the notion of separation of powers where the three branches are co-equal, there is always the danger that when a court exercises a power of judicial review, in a sense, it is beginning to uh, infringe into the powers of the executive as it attempts to determine whether or not the decisions of the executive are actually lawful or not. And for this reason, uh, courts have created certain principles that where certain decisions are best left to the executive, mainly because they are the representatives of the people, then courts will not seek uh, to, to look into or review uh, those types of decision, because then it would be inappropriate for the court to interfere with such matters. And uh, those typically... Those matters, for example, uh, will involve decisions made by the cabinet. So when the cabinet makes decisions, for example, as to uh, whether or not they would allow uh, mining to be a key policy issue or whether or not uh, they should look into global warming as an important agenda or whether or not uh, in terms of the budget, uh, certain, certain uh, sectors of society should be favored and some should be disfavored. These are matters which uh, courts typically will not interfere with because they're typically considered non-justiciable in the sense that they are best left to the executive to make decisions as the representative of the people. So issues about spending money, spending public funds, or whether or not uh, certain facil public facilities should be constructed, or issues concerning international relations, uh, whether or not uh, it is proper for uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott to invite uh, Vladimir Putin to Australia for the G20 summit. These are matters which are uh, deemed to be highly political. So in other words, uh, it's best left to the executive to make decisions because in that case that involves political standards or political considerations which are best left to the executive uh, to make. The other aspect about just uh, justiciability is that um, judicial power should only be exercised in relation to actual controversies involving rights to right, life, liberty, or property. So in other words, if there is no matter in the sense that there is actually no aggrieved party, there is no right that is violated, then in that particular case, it is not a justiciable issue. If uh, there is only a. There might be the possibility of uh, certain rights being uh, being uh, 
affected, again, that goes to the issue of justiciability. It is not ripe for judicial review in that sense because the power of the courts may only be exercised in relation to matters, in which case there has to be an actual controversy involving the violation of, of rights. And that leads us to the issue of standing because standing is very is, is closely related to the issue of matter. So we, we said earlier that matter must involve an actual controversy involving the violation of rights. So therefore, it is essential that uh, an applicant uh, for, of judicial review must show that he or she has legal standing. And to be able to show legal standing, that person must be able to demonstrate a legal interest. And that legal interest uh, we, will often be shown by showing that there are certain rights, specific identifiable rights that have been violated or that there has been a liability that has been imposed on a person. And uh, essentially, when you talk about judicial review, there are three courts that uh, are involved in judicial review. You have the High Court on the basis specifically of uh, Section 75 of the Constitution. And then you have the Federal Court and you have the Federal Circuit Court, which previously was called the uh, Federal Magistrates Court. And I would suggest that, you know, uh, we, we it's not important uh, in this course that we really look into whether or not it's the High Court which has jurisdiction or whether or not the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court has jurisdiction because that will be an issue for, uh, that, that is something that is, uh, that should be covered more by by uh, civil procedure, with the course of civil procedure. So it's just enough that uh, you have an understanding that as far as judicial review is concerned, it is typically uh, these three courts that uh, will be involved in uh, judicial review. So having said that, uh, I would imagine that uh, at the end of the session, we would have been able to discuss and explain the concept of judicial review and uh, when it is available to review administrative decisions. should also be in a position to distinguish judicial review from merit review. Should always, you should also be able to discuss and explain the framework and legal basis for judicial review in Australia and discuss and explain the requirements of justiciability in judicial review.